Test is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tim Cusick, and I am the Training Peaks WKO product leader, and I will be leading the webinar. I already see people telling me they can hear me. You guys are getting too good at this. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, I still see a couple of last minute joiners. Okay, I still see a lot of last minute joiners. So I'm just letting people log in. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. First off, let me just talk about asking questions as we go. I mean, look, a lot of us are kind of more stuck at home in, in, in these kind of challenging times. So I'm putting together these webinars. I'm trying to do once every week, but at the longest, once every other week, just to give people some opportunity to use the time to learn and engage. Um, that being said, these webinars are a little less formal than the online ones that you've seen. And, and there's always, there's a library of those. They can be found on the, the Training Peaks uh, YouTube site. There's a great playlist of them. So these are a little more interactive and conversational and a little more topical, right? I'm kind of just taking on very tight topics. But to really make it all work, please feel free to ask questions as you go. Here's a great opportunity to just ask. Um, you can ask, you have this little box on the right, usually on the right-hand side of your screen. You can open and close that with the little orange arrow. You will find, yours looks a little different, questions right here, right? If you just open that question, you have the ability to ask questions there. Um, and many of you already know. I've already received a question or two about the handout. Um, I forgot <laughs> to load the handout before I launched the meeting, which means I can't do it now. But uh, I'm going to post this right up. Debbie is ready to post it right when I'm done to our YouTube site. And we will link the handout in a Dropbox right there. So you will get it and have the opportunity to get it. I apologize about that delay. All right, let's jump in and get rolling now. Wow. Thanks, everybody, for joining. That's a pretty big webinar. Um, let's just start off as we're talking about today's topic, actually, is the role of eye levels and optimized intervals. I've seen a fair amount of questions on these things recently. And for me, it's always better to kind of pull back and answer it in kind of a broader, bigger picture. So to do that, let's just understand a little bit of background, right? When it comes to training and we're looking at, you know, performance, we're looking at response to exercise stimuli, we're looking at physiological change within an athlete, one absolute truth is no two athletes are alike. I mean, the reality is, and you know, and this is all, this is the evolution of all training. Um, I see somebody saying that you don't see my screen, so just a quick stopping point. Are others not seeing my screen? I uh, should be. So good. Most are seeing it. So if you're not seeing the screen, it's something in your settings. You might not have it open. Okay, excellent. Pressing on. So um, no two athletes are alike, right? And this is why we have this. And we've been training, to be honest, my, again, my opinion, the generalized approach towards training, whether it's runners or cyclists, really since the 1900, early 1900s, when we started figuring out like intervals and things like that, uh, has been a generalized approach. And then coaches eventually developed the skill to individualize it because they noticed difference in athletes and stuff like that. Now what you have when we have all of this technology, knowledge, science, information, right? Individualizing your training is absolutely the way to leap forward, have better efficacy in training and the response to training and all of those items. Why? And it really says it right here, and I make this statement a lot, right? Because we do have the ability now to understand the performing athlete's unique physiology and then use that physiology to better train the athlete or use the understanding of that physiology to better train the athlete, right? But up to this time, and I, you know, five years ago, and you see this more and more in other, not just our own software, but up to this time, we've been relying on generalized rules. We, you know, Dr. Andy Coggin, as we all know, created this idea of functional threshold power, which was amazing for the time. He had this wonderful vision of, let's make this simple, let's take this power data, let's set up a simple system that is all these people in the world and all these coaches are learning to train with power or coach by power, 
we're going to give them a simple system. So he takes FTP, creates the idea, and comes up with the classic levels. But the reality is those classic levels were based on a bell curve of information simply looking at a database that was available of information at the time and making general determinations of how hard or not how easy <laughs> you know you should go in a way to stress certain physiological or physiological zones or or certain physiology within your body right and when you look at that bell curve it kind of looks like this and the reality of the bell curve is you know you have 50% of the universe that classic levels still works pretty well for. Um, you know, the whole idea of building on a bell curve is you're trying to get as many people accurate as you want. And it was really a fantastic job. I mean, Andy's ability to, to do this stuff is unparalleled. But unfortunately, that meant that 25% over here and 25% over here, they were outliers. They were more unique. And when it came to the prescription and analysis of training, they needed something that better represented them, something more individualized. When we set out to create WKL4 and then obviously trickling into WKL5, the main goal we had was to break down that barrier of generalized training and give coaches and obviously athletes and self-coached athletes a simple, low-cost way to individualize their training. So what is individualized training? It's training that recognizes the unique physiology of the individual athlete, allowing for specific, highly focused diagnostic analysis, training prescription, and individualized performance analytics to, to improve training efficiency and effectiveness. I swear, that's the only slide I will read. But it's so true, right? That was our goal. That was our mission when we set out with WKL4. And really, if you look at it this way, we wanted to progress training from this idea of random training, which led to generalized training. Now we are at a point where all athletes, and if I was, you know, and I don't much just preaching it because I sell it. There's other systems that have really helped make this evolution. Um, but individualized training simply is a better answer. Our particular approach is what we call the individual training and response footprint. And to do that, we really needed a really good, aggressive, um, really good, accurate model, which we created in the power duration model, which lives within WKL4 or WKL5. What does it look like? Very simple. And this isn't on the power duration model, and I just did one two weeks ago. You could watch that one. But this is what it looks like. Basically, we're modeling the red line here, the power duration curve of an athlete. We're using that model not to predict FTP or predict a number. We're using that to better understand the athlete philosophy, or philosophy <laughs> the athlete physiology. Why? Using the specific exercising athlete to better understand their physiology and then translate that into using their specific physiology to better understand how to specifically train them. You know, and it's a statement you see, I bet you everybody here has probably seen this slide once or twice. I use it everywhere because it's the core of what will improve your coaching, right? If we understand the specific athlete's physiology and we understand how to apply it, right, to their training, we can improve it. The challenge learns, and what I've been doing in these last couple of informal webinars is really teaching you how to apply it because it's still an art. There's an underlying science. We understand physiology as a science. The way you make energy is a science. But you still need the art to target it. So the reality is when we're looking at the role of eye levels and optimized intervals, it's part of the art of applying the specific understanding of that athlete's physiology into their training or into, if you're the coach, into your training prescription for the athlete. So when we built this model, the first thing we saw was that the approach towards classic training levels uh, needed some improvement because we saw this, right? And what this is, is, besides being a bunch of colorful lines, right, this is a whole lot of athletes mean maximal power curves. Each one of these represents an athlete, a very clean data set within the database. And what we have here is the power duration curve. So here we have over time, the simple logarithmic scale you've seen 
a dozen thousand times in your life. But here we have percentage of variance off average. So we can see as this number goes up, it's a higher percentage in variance. So when you look at time frames, let's call it out from a thousand seconds to the right, there really isn't that much variance, right? In the aerobic areas, in the generally aerobic areas of oversimplification, we see a pretty similar performance, meaning not humans don't vary all that much from each other on what creates aerobic stimuli and what, what creates aerobic response. What, what is aerobic effort, I guess you might say. But as soon as you start getting shorter time frames than a thousand seconds, and definitively here as you kind of get to, you know, 500, you know, it's always hard with the logarithmic scale, but you see, remember, these are percentage variances from 250 to, you know, 600% differences is the bulk here. And that's why we really needed a better solution than the classic training levels, which I'm going to get into a little deeper, because the classic zones can result, remember, the classic zones would be built on one curve, one bell curve, that center average of this, right? So everybody down here and everybody down there wouldn't be getting the best training description or prescription. Now, it's easy to see this, and I've shown this example before, and I'm not going to get too stuck on this. Um, sorry, I'm just watching questions as I go. Please feel free to ask your questions as you go. Don't be afraid. I'll get to them. Um, if you looked at Joe and Jane Ryder, right, if I scale these two athletes, and you look at this visually and you're looking at it in your screen, they look very similar. They both have a threshold of around 270 watts. These athletes are very similar. But you do notice some slight differences just by looking at the curve. Well, part of what happens frequently in any time you look at a chart or a graph of athletes, everything's set on some scale. And the scale is usually like zero as the minimum and then the maximum number, meaning it's just using whatever max number and using that as the upward scale. But the reality is if you look at these two, this max number here actually happens way down here. So Joe's max is a different, you know, it's a good bit lower than Jane's. And the reality is they look the same from afar. But if you laid these two on the same scale, right, what it would look like is this. Now, if I put the, and these are on the same scale, I know this one says a little more than 600. It was just because I zoomed the stupid chart. But the reality is you can see it getting steeper here, much steeper in there. And then we go off the scale if I fix it. So you can see now that there's actually a really big difference, even though they have the same general threshold, look, 269, 272, there's a big difference in the way these two athletes perform on um, lower, shorter time frames. So having this, the same prescription using classic levels, the same anaerobic capacity targets, which you would have, and I'm going to demo in a second, would not make sense the stress-strain relationship for these two athletes would not be the same. So to counter that problem, we developed eye levels. This idea of individualized training zones that allows us to better understand or better target or achieve specific and precise physiological adaptations from training based on their athlete's unique physiology. So when we start talking about eye levels, the why. What we developed them to deal with that wide variation of power output at and above FTP, which I just showed you, all those colorful squiggly lines, right, show all that variance. Who up to this point, until we had a chance to model it and really look at it very closely, we didn't realize how wide that variance was. Now we know, and now we know that there's a lot better stuff that we can do with individualizing it. So we needed an individualized training level or training zone systems. So we created eye levels. What are eye levels? It's a new nine zone targeting system, individualizing and further quantifying the classic seven zone system, which I'm gonna show in the next slide. And it's important, I still see confusion on this with a lot of new users. It's not based on FTP. There's a correlation to FTP. Remember what I showed you here, there really is, there simply isn't much change. You know, FTP is happening out here, right? There's a lot of similarity. The variances really are in here. So 
the new system, the I-level system, is not based on FTP. It will look sometimes FTP is correlated to it. Um, there's a relationship, but it's based on your entire power duration curve. So I get a lot of questions at times, and I ask people, can you be more specific? Because I'm, I'm trying to really get the right questions out of people. Like my FTP is seems this or seems low, and my does that mean I'm doing my 40-second intervals wrong or something like that? If you're using eye levels, it's using the entire curve. It's not based off your FTP. And at the end of the day, I'm here to tell you, as probably the longest-term user, you know, this, Andy and I have been working together on eye levels since the beginning, um, you know, and, and I was prescribing it and working with athletes when it was still in super early beta. So the reality is I can tell you with confidence that, in my opinion, <laughs> confidence, I guess, in my own opinion, it's a superior targeting system. So let's go back. Let's take a look at this nine zone system versus a classic seven zone system. So here's a chart we put together that shows how the classic training zones, the classic Coggin levels that you're used to relate to I levels. And we put a little idea of what we're targeting in between, right? What we're looking at as far as a, a stress strain and adaptation um, relationship. So here you have your seven levels, recovery, endurance, tempo, FTP, VO2 max, anaerobic capacity, and then neuromuscular power really wasn't a level because we couldn't quantify it except max. Now we have nine cog and I levels, recovery, endurance, tempo. So now we sw split tempo into sweet spot. A lot of people do sweet spot work. They wanted it specifically designed. We have the ability to target it off the power duration curve, so we did. But what, have you, what you do notice is it's not these zones have dramatically changed. They've just gotten a little smaller, a little tighter, a little more specific. The overarching range, right, has narrowed. It's more specific. Then here's we go into some new ones. And I'm not going to go over all these definitions because you can watch Individualizing Your Training with WK5 as the webinar. We'll give you in-depth understanding of these. But FRC really is your anaerobic work capacity. All right. So here we see transition, anaerobic work and threshold just above threshold. Here we see true anaerobic. Here we see Pmax FRC and pure Pmax. So in some ways, right, we have nine, we had seven levels. They haven't really changed. It's not suddenly like the paradigm of stress and strain on the system has changed. We're quantifying it. We are targeting it more specifically. And we're targeting in a way that is not using. This is all based off percentages, right? You want to do a VO2 max work, it's 105 to 120%, I think, right, of FTP. But that's a generalized percentage. These here in the eye levels are based off your actual performing data, your model. Now, the downside of that is as we begin to think in training prescription and description, we have more levels to think about. Uh, it's more complex, right? There's nine levels instead of six slash seven. And as a matter of fact, one of the things I put in here, if you look at where training levels started, really, if you're looking at it from just the, the most basic approach towards physiology, you have three zone level, just a zone one, which basically and just oversimplified, right, is your leads up to aerobic threshold, zone two, which leads up to your anaerobic threshold and everything over. And I did not size these or anything like that. I just put them there for three zones. So in the end of the day, a three zone system is very simple to understand, right, and simple to prescribe. But there isn't a whole lot of specificity of, wow, my my rider, my athlete, my runner needs to develop this specific capability you end up prescribing within each one of these zones anyway. The seven zone system was trying to do just that, give a little better clarity to each one of those zones. And the nine level does just that, even more clarity, more ability to target a, and more specifically target a very specific physiological response. And really, when you look at that, you have what's going on here in the middle. It starts out this idea that you're simply building into these areas and don't take anything exact here, but you see transitional colors, your aerobic endurance or what I call extensive, 
your extensive aerobic capability. As you move through and go harder, you move to our aerobic power, the intensive. Push forward, you're moving into your anaerobic endurance, your extensive. Push forward, higher, harder, or whatever you want to say, anaerobic power, intensive. And at some point, you're just purely working on maximal power. So all, you know, the simplest two points to take away from this slide is you have nine zones now. And those nine zones, yeah, it's add some complexity, right? You got to think nine versus three versus seven, right? But it gives you a better way to specifically affect a desire, or specifically target and describe and to analyze a desired physiological response. Now, in reality, you know, if we're looking at the seven zone system, let's take a look at seven zones for Jane and Joe Ryder. So here's Jane and Joe Ryder. I don't think the time frames were the same of what I was showing, but the reality is these are two athletes pretty similar. And with the same FTP, let's pick the fact that they're doing anaerobic capacity work, right? And that would be in the old system, 327 watts or higher for Joe. And for Jane, it would be 333 watts. So they have a six watt difference in the prescription based on the fact that they have similar FTPs. And these are the classic power zones you see here, right? Classic power zones. And since they have similar FTPs, they have very similar targets. Same at VO2 max intervals, 292 to 333 for Jane, 286. So a good same six watt difference, 286 to 327 for VO2 max. Six watts really is not very different. But now the reality is if you go back to this analysis I showed you, right, there actually was a pretty big difference between those two. So let's look at it in eye levels. Now, if you pick like pick FRC as an example, right, this athlete, Jane Ryder, is 419 to 574. And for a time frame, because eye levels now give us an understanding of time frame, because we're looking at a curve, not a flat FTP line. So her is targets would be 419 to 574, and you see 39 seconds to 143, where Joe's are 390 to 465, right? 26 seconds to 101. So you're getting a dramatically different time and intensity targeting, because if you remember, they made power differently. Similar, when you go down here, look at their sweet spots are probably pretty similar, 240 to 259, 237 to 255, a little flatter curve uh, here. So the reality is they're similar, but those training levels are individualized to them. They're unique to them and to their performance. Okay. So let's talk about, I'm just going to zoom all this in, the benefits of moving to eye levels. I don't want to get too caught up on this, and I'm trying to catch up. I must be doing a great job explaining because I'm getting very few questions, so rock on. Um, basically, a better diagnostics, better planning, better tracking. So really, you can use eye levels to understand, you know, the power duration model and eye levels to understand how to improve these areas. Because it really, and I could summarize this, it's based on your actual performing data, which gives insight into your physiology. It's individual to you and allows me to be you know, very specific in the training description, prescription, um, the training, the, you know, the, 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 the training dose. And then I can also track at a level. And at the end of the day, optimize, I'm sorry, eye levels evolve with your power duration curve. So as you have micro changes in fitness, you will have micro changes in, um, those eye levels, meaning it just, you know, if think about what the power duration model is using your last rolling 30 days, I'm sorry, last rolling 90 days. Um, as you add better fitness and fitness goes up or sometimes unfortunately down, right? That is evolving with you and it's making micro changes as you go to make sure you're always training at the right target. Um, so here's a good question. I'm going to read this one out loud. Is there any downside of using eye levels for all athletes, or are there certain profiles that you can just keep in traditional models? Great question, Jason. So you got to go all the way back to that bell curve reality. I would use eye levels for everyone because the reality is 
if they fit right within the I'm just going backwards if they fit within the classic level meaning they're that wow they're in that bell curve that 50 percent eye levels will be much closer to the same right the eye levels would closely match the classic levels but you get two benefits that you don't see here right because here's the percentages these are based on one you get any minor little tweaks that it might pick up because no no one perfectly fits the bell curve but two you get good insight into the duration of work required in intervals, you know, to be able to do that work. So to be able to do that work. So the reality is you'd be able to, you know, you get better information. So here's my answer and don't take this wrong. Eye levels are a better solution because it gives you an individualized approach with more information about the athlete and a better and more specific way to target. Why wouldn't you use it? So to me, that's why I would do it. Um, yeah, so two good questions, more procedural, but I'll take them since we're talking eye levels. Um, is there a way to target range in power, to, to set the target range of power in TP since when using power as a metric, it's a percentage of FTP only? I don't run that development side, but I, we get that question a lot. And I have a feeling, um, you know, it's in the pipeline. <laughs> if I say too much, I always get in trouble. But yeah, I mean, it would be nice to have that functionality and certainly something I support. Meaning when you write your training, if you know your athlete's eye levels or your own eye levels, you can uh, translate that into structured workouts. It is, I think, something... Uh, Probably in the pipeline. I should, shouldn't say anymore. Um, David, uh, good question. Where would you identify strengths and limiters? Uh, David, I'm going to hold your question until I do my demo in WK05. I got a couple of demo pieces to show you, so I'll show it in there. Um, so, James, great question. Sit tight. All right, pressing on. The next thing we have is optimized intervals, right? And optimized intervals. Is simply a method of targeting a specific time and intensity of training. So think about eye levels. Think about it as good, better, best, right? Classic levels are good. Eye levels are better. But at the end of the day, optimized intervals are best. And um, because you're going to use the deepest insight into the athlete. And the good, better, best process assumes you have a good model. I mean, I did a uh, two weeks ago, whatever, maybe it was even last week, it's all blended together at the moment. I did a, you know, how to establish your power duration curve short webinar. As long as you manage, you have your good power duration curve, I feel very strongly that you will benefit from good, better, best. Classic levels are good. Eye levels are better. Optimized intervals are best. So because it gives a specific time and intensity for training based on the athlete's physiology and physiological needs. It optimizes interval mode, interval modalities. So when you think about something, right, this is a classic chart. And I bet you pretty much everybody here in one way or another has seen this type of chart. And you're looking at energy systems, blue being your ATP, CP system. And that's your fight or flight fuel readily available, you know, but very short term. You know, you see here zero seconds. It's typically anywhere from, you know, most times you see it talked about, you know, eight to 15 seconds, maybe, but all the way out to 20, but then it drops off. Next, you have this anaerobic beginning approach. You really have your lactate. There's a lot of ways to say it, but you really have that system beginning to take up. Um, it gives you energy for a little longer, but at the end of the day, your aerobic system. So you have anaerobic glycolysis here. You have your oxidative system or aerobic system here. And eventually all longer term energy is your, um, the way, you know, this is time and intensity. I don't want to get too deep into this, but I'll answer questions later if you need them. Well, what the model allows us to understand is where those points peak and where they cross over, right? And if we understand that, or when we, or how we understand that is, we can look at the model and we see points of exertion, like at what points are the, in my arrows, I didn't point towards something specific, you guys, I'm just kind of making three unique points somewhere on a, on a chart there. 
So the reality is it gives us some specific insight into points of exertion on the model, like where if this number, you know, was if this, it, I'm hesitating because there is some proprietary information here and too much gives away how we do our modeling. And I'm sorry, you know, people ask me a fair amount why we black box it because people just copy it. Look how many PMCs there are in the world. Look how many, you know, all the things that we've created over time now are in every piece of software. So it just is what it is. So because we understand those specific points of exertion, then we also understand the relationship between time and um, intensity of those points, right? And we can use those points of influence of exertion to prescribe workouts, that exact intersection of time and intensity, which would have the greatest impact on the performing athlete. And that creates optimized intervals. And I'm going to, guys, I'm going to jump under WK4 and kind of just show, I'm sorry, WK4, WK5, and show you where some of these things live and answer questions as best I can. So right now I'm just kind of showing you. But if you go in your cycling training zones and right up top, these are your optimized intervals. I can grab this out of my random set of data, which I've got to start using better real data because it doesn't always make perfect sense. But you can see here if this person wants to do their if this person wants to develop pure Pmax, they're needing a nine second sprint at 550 to 539 to 559, somewhere in that range or or greater. Now, let's say they want to develop pure FRC, they need a 44 second sprint at 405 to 385 watts. That's because we see that point of influence, right? Call it here. Um, we see that model parameter uh, and what is affecting it. Now, would I prescribe 44 second intervals? No, I'd probably round those, right? <laughs> um, but you see a pretty tight range of power prescription. Everything on this side is driven by the model. This is myself and Dean Golich actually sat down and created just some general recommendations for the time and repeats and stuff like that. But really focus on this. You know, if you want to develop your max aerobic, which you could also call a VO2 max, for this athlete, it's 244, 320 to 300 watts. So if, would you round that to 245? Yes. I mean, I don't care, do 244 if it suits you, but 245 might be a little easier. So this athlete might be going out there and banging away at four minute intervals, but they might be better doing them for, at 245. And then there's some rest ratio recommendations, how long total time in that zone is and some reps. So you've gotten some guidance there. So optimized intervals kind of evolve eye levels to be the next step. But understand, and this gets a little confusing, it was this question in the Facebook group last week that got me to do this webinar. Optimized intervals will reside within the eye levels, meaning it doesn't take you outside the eye level. So the eye levels get you, you know, one ring away from the bullseye and the optimized interval gets you at the bullseye. Um, obviously, we don't, we're not in the business of telling you how to coach. We're saying, here's what the model and the data says. That's totally up to you if you decide, well, I'm going to use that specifically. I'm going to modify that based on my own learning experience, or I'm going to use something totally different. That's great. We're just giving you one system based off the power duration model that gives you a better and a best way of targeting time intensity in intervals. Um, Okay, I'm going to take a two-second break here and answer some of the questions that have been piling up because I don't want to go too far in. I'm going to jump over to demos in a moment. Um, so somebody asked, what are your reasoning methodologies for choosing the high and low time duration in eye levels, or do you look to progress? So James, that's a really good question. Um, let me just go back to eye levels. I hate doing this to you guys. This is why I try not to use all this animation. So what's setting this right? Because the curve, look at a power duration curve, right? So the way we understand what the question is, is how do we pick this time, right? How will we know that FRC is best developed between 390 and 465 watts between 26 and 101, right? 26 seconds and one minute and one. 
because we're looking at that physiological, because the model is telling us about your physiology, go back to that energy slide that I was showing where you're crossing over. And I hate using that term because physiologists jump on it as incorrect, but just in the sense of that visual, that slide, we know where you cross over the energy system, where it peaks and where it drops into another energy system. So basically the time range is telling you the two crossover points. So you could think about, it's not just picking a point, just to, you know, imagine, I used to be able to draw in my webinars. I'm not sure that'll be a good idea because I'll keep you guys here all day. But imagine like, you know, that, that little energy system peak, you know, the line, like your FRC, your, your, your anaerobic energy, anaerobic system is coming up around here, like your ATP is shutting down around nine seconds, it comes up, it peaks here and drops back down here. And that's where your aerobic system takes over, right? Imagine that peak line happening like that. We're measuring the distance between those two, right? What's happening in those two crossover points. And then we use that to get the time. So hopefully that helps. Another really great question, good question, Ray. On the seven versus nine zone chart, 4A should be 3A and 7A should be six. It's a little confusing when 4A and 7A come before four and seven respectively. Yeah, I've seen that argument. It just is what it is. And trying to change back would just, oop, I'm going the wrong way, would just breed more confusion. So, you know, basically you got what, what everyone's saying, what um, Ray is saying is sweet spot should be four and threshold should be 4A because the 4A should come after. Um, it's a long story how it got to that way. Uh, and then once it was kind of live and running, we just didn't mess with it. Um, next question. If my FRC FTP max aerobic optimized interval says 336 to 356, but my FRC extensive says, how can I possibly prescribe a workout targeting FRC at those watts? The target is very high. So Patrick, here's what I would answer that question. So if you're saying your, your FRC is 690 to 710 watts, um, and let's say the timing, uh, why did I put all the stupid anima animation in there? So let's say you're talking about this realm here, right? For 44 seconds, this athlete is there. So you're saying the target is 690 to 710 watts, and that's very high. The only way, and you guys, if everybody understands what I'm about to say, you're going to make a huge leap in understanding. The only way the model is going to prescribe that type of watts is if the athlete has already done something very close. So think about this point of example, right? Imagine it happening at one minute right here is the model is based off your actual mean maximal power. And that means the athlete has done that in some type of way or close to that in their mean maximal power. Now, it might be at a point where there's a dip like here, right, which shows it's off. But it's only using your athlete's historical performance to do it. So if your athlete can't hit that data point, right, if they can't hit those interval, it tells you one of two things. And Serena, thank you for saying it. Point one is you probably have bad data. Because somewhere in there, I guarantee you, when you're looking at the model of that athlete, that yellow line is kind of close to the red line, or it's way under because you have something really wonky going on. But that means the athlete has done it. From a performance sense, is to go out and do FRC intervals at 690 to 710 watts, that's, that's a strong anaerobic rider, but very well, very well within the realm of feasibility. Um, I, I come from a track. Yeah, I have I have pursued her kind of phenotype and and have a strong anaerobic capacity, um, and I do my anaerobic work between six and seven hundred watts. Um, that's I want me to do. I do my FTP work at about two hundred and fifty watts. So you know, some you win, some you lose. But that's exactly the whole point, right? You we each are different in individual. So one, make sure you have the right data. Two, then go back and compare it against, I'm sorry, make sure you have accurate data by comparing it against your actual historical performance. And then watch the power duration, how to establish your power duration curve webinar I did last week, that would help too. And then two, 
Um, the question you might be asking is, what if my athlete can only do two or three intervals? Well, that tells you something, right? If they can do it once, but can't do it more than twice or three times, they have a fatigue resistant issue. They have other issues, right? And you need to be able to get them to do that work anyway. So check your data, check what they've actually done, validate it against history, and I guarantee it will be close to their actual performance. Um, then if, if the data is right and you have seen historical performance close to that or at that number, then just build the intervals. So knock, if they can't really do it, knock a little bit off. Maybe they're just a testing superstar. But the reality is they probably have some wonky data in there. So Jeff asks, can I clarify what reps estimate progression means? So let's say, so the question is, can I clarify what reps estimate? progressive means. So let's say you're about to go do the same max aerobic work. We're saying somewhere between three and 12 intervals, right? Um, the best way to prescribe your intervals, right? The best way to prescribe intervals is find out what the athlete can do. So let's just say I had the athlete doing three minute intervals here, just keeping them thinking simple. I would prescribe three times five the first VO2 max, right? The first max aerobic interval of the season. And when they did five, I would say, give me the quant, uh, uh, the, the, uh, <laughs> give me your, or describe how you felt. Give me the qualitative data. And if they say that was easy, okay, well then we'll go to six. Or I finished five and I felt I had a little more energy, then you go to six. And when they do six, they're like, man, that was all I could do. That's great. Do six again until it feels right, then do seven. And then eventually seven might become eight. At three minutes, I probably wouldn't do many more than eight. But you get my point. You need to progress the intervals. And what you're really looking at is progressing the total time and zone. So three times five is um, 15 minutes of targeted zone. In WKO5, you can look at time at VO2 max. I would look at above 90%, maybe 95%. Um, once you start, you can do 15 minutes in time, you know, targeted time and zone, then that should progress to a total of, so do four times four, that's 16 minutes, right? I'm not saying you shouldn't do the optimized intervals. I'm just giving ideas of how to progress. The point being and a mistake, I see so many self-coached athletes and some coached athletes make, they'll start doing right out of the beginning of the season. I'm doing seven times three minutes and they'll do seven times three minutes all season long. And maybe try to do them a little harder, but progress the number of reps, progress your total time in the zone until you're really focused on peaking. So hopefully that answers your question. Good. I think I've gotten all the questions. I'm going to delete all the ones I have because it was getting hard to track them on the screen. If you have new ones or if I just accidentally deleted yours, ask it again. Okay. So as a final slide, before I go to demo, I grabbed these on off of Facebook today, right? And I think it's so cool that people are looking to do unique ways of looking at it. Sitting here in the background, this was a chart that somebody posted an image of, and basically all they've done is taken the power duration curve. They've made lines where the optimized intervals will sit. And they're using curves under a curve. They're measuring what's 90% and what's 95%. And they're using that curve under the curve, which I've taught in bigger webinars, and is somewhat my secret system. I'm still holding some secrets, but it's a great visual way to look at it. This is that time range. I think it was James who asked. They're, they're measuring that time range. You're seeing it where it falls on the curve. Another person today did a pretty cool layout of looking at their optimized targets, right? By putting all the information into a gauge chart. So, this is part of it as you and you could even modify it. You might find that you wanted you want that your athletes doing 5% less than what the model is saying. Okay, take the take the expression minus, you know, and times it by 95%. There's lots of ways just because I say and I caution this in all of my webinars I should have started here. Just because I'm saying this is a good system, um don't believe me. Don't believe that when you read these hypes online of all these great systems, superior, this is better. Just because somebody's on the internet or in a webinar saying it with conviction, you as a coach or a self-coached athlete with a goal, you have a responsibility to learn and to experiment and vet 
what you hear. So don't take what I'm saying as gospel, right? I'm challenging the thinking. I'm showing you what I believe is a better system. But what I'm really saying to you and what I'm really taking the time to try to do is to learn as a whole and begin to broaden. Because go back to my original point. I'm not trying to make you a better scientist. I'm trying to make you a better artist, right? And your ability to learn and to absorb and to test this stuff will give you greater science knowledge. But what we really want is to improve your artistry of coaching. And that's what you're looking for. Okay, let's jump into some Q&A, but I'm going to do, oh, I'm going to do a little bit of WKO. I have some uh, sample athletes. I don't, I didn't prepare anything. Sorry, I got stuck in a meeting just before this webinar. I wanted to have a couple of things on the screen ready to roll. Um, I haven't loaded this athlete for a long time. Idea if there's data. This is what I call my sandbox, meaning I have a bunch of data sets in here. Oftentimes I show this, but I don't, the data might not make sense underlying because it could be 10 different people piled together. That's why it's called a sandbox. Um, so when one of the questions I had was uh, where to find strengths and weaknesses um, and a couple of other questions about where you find these different informations and targets. So the most important place to start with training zones, if you look at zones, right, look at zones and zones for cycling, I'm always testing different views and I probably have some weird stuff on here, right? So right up top, the zones dashboard is your optimized intervals. Here's a cool little trick because you see that text is kind of small and I'm an old man and seeing that with my eyes isn't really good. I can go and I can configure the chart. I can make the text huge. There's my old man text, right? So just a quick trick. And we see this athlete's numbers and stuff here. Um, and then you have all of the other zones where you can see here's eye levels, here's classic zones. You know, and even this quote unquote athlete, you see a much more granular level off the same power. You really see actually this person did a little more work out here than you're seeing out here. Again, I'm not sure how accurate their data is and how clean their model is. Um, and you have heart rate zones and information zones. So that's where you would find all of your zones. Now, if you look in the insights page, we give some insights as far as trends and um, information and knowledge. But let's say, you know, the question I received was you wanted to know strengths and weaknesses. So if I click on my whiteboard, right, which is a great place to add charts, and I see this little down arrow and I click, and I want to add an existing chart, so I click on that. So up here, right, this launches my little UI. See where it says chart library? Make sure you always have chart library selected. The chart library is the WKO library where we maintain the originals. Um, you'll see multiple copies because you've opened it for different people and potentially changed it, but still when you load it, we'll it will load the original. What if I search for um, strength and I'm trying to remember the name of the chart. Let's see. Yeah, so right there, pretty PD profile strengths and limiters. So if you just double click it, this is a great chart. And this will show a their strengths and limiters. These are standard deviations. Blue is average. So this person has a short limiter, not really good in that 20 to 40 second length, but their strengths are here. There's a bunch of other charts that will show you, a um, bunch of other charts that will show you strength. The weakness is just search through the chart packs. I thought we had a profile. Oh, yeah, duh. Here's a profile dashboard. I use my own unique, I've set up my own dashboards, as I'm sure you guys have probably most of you have done the same. And if you look at the profile dashboard, you can do against world class, but age and age adjusted for us old folks, the same strength and weakness so I showed you. And here's a classic power profile in cycling, just like you would have in training peaks. So it's all over there. Um, all types of stuff that you can look at. Now, if you want to look at a different view, so you can click on your views if you've had it before, if you click on the view, you can also access views from here, choose an existing view, right? 
again, go to the view library. Always go to the library where the masters are. If you look at the advanced um, ones, there's a WKO advanced cycling view. You can open that. I already have it open somewhere. Um, sorry, it always pushes it to the background. Um, then there's profiles and different things in there. So don't be afraid to play around and look at what's, so see profile advanced, now that you're looking at advanced. Profile advanced. And this is a really in-depth, I mean, this is gonna kind of make you have to sit and look at this over two cups of coffee, but it's a really cool way to look at it once you understand what's saying. And again, these are baby steps to becoming an artist, right? Um, I have everything you just saw compiled into one chart um, for me, but you see these unique ways of looking at things. And that's where we're just giving you the analytics, the tools, the measurement to score. Um, so, Tim, I think I answered your question on the uh, with the zones. So if you're looking for time and zones, just go to zones. Right. So if you're looking how to measure time and zones. So you, I see what you're saying. You're asking for time and optimized time. Um, I don't think we have an official one, but it'd probably be somewhat easy to build. Um, I think if you post that question in Facebook, we can get a couple of people working on it. But when it comes to specifically the zones, it's in your you know time and zone you're seeing right here. So time and zone is in your zones dashboard in any of the WKO views. Kate, I see your question. Um, I don't have those charts in my sandbox, so I'm not sure, but I can take a look and get you an answer. Um, hopefully then I've answered all the questions. And again, I'm doing these as lighter, more interaction discussionary points. But I'm also just trying to give, you know, obviously some specific feedback on how to use eye levels. Um, hopefully you've gained some of that information today. I think the real progress is getting here. If you look at the ones I've done over the last couple of weeks, I've shown you how to clean and, and get your model accurate. And that generates eye levels. Again, I'm not saying believe me, but I would highly recommend you at least use eye levels and look deeply at optimized intervals. You will get a much more clear approach. So James asks, what are your thoughts on targeting where max aerobic and anaerobic cross? Um, so James, my answer to that in training, right, there's always a cost of training. One of the mistakes I see people also make is we attempt to get the best of both worlds. And in physiology, in the dose-response relationship to exercise stimuli, you usually get the worst of both worlds. Specificity is the answer. If you have a specific demand, a specific need, target it specifically. Bang away at that specific point. When you start talking about crossovers and some other things, you might be getting the worst of both worlds. I know that's a general answer and not specific, but it's a very big question and would be hard to answer without a lot of knowledge of what you are trying to do. So when people look at intervals and say, wow, if I go just in between, I'll get both threshold and VO2 max. Yeah, but then it fatigues you so much and you can't finish that last interval or, or you've gone five watts slower throughout it all. You're not creating the same stimuli. You're probably better off doing threshold intervals one day and at and a, you know, a true threshold and getting in the maximum amount of time in that zone, or, or actually I should say, and then do a really good VO2 max workout and get maximum time in that zone, then trying to split the difference. Cool. I think, I think I've gotten everybody's questions. It's great to see so many people on. I guess it's great, unfortunately. You know, and, and in closing, I just, I wish everybody, you know, hope everybody's safe and sound in the world, right? And, you know, make sure that you're taking care of yourself and you play it safe, help those around you. 
um, you know, and, and I wish for the best for everyone. These are trying times and I'm going to keep doing these ad hoc webinars. We're all running a little crazy, but I'll, I'll try to keep, you know, something out there that we can use this time to learn. And when, when we kind of emerge, maybe we'll emerge a little more knowledgeable and a little better and ready to go. Stay safe, everybody. Talk to you soon.